All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Welcome back to Wayne Fleet. Thank you. So uh, our first question for you is, how did you, a white male from Maine, decide that you wanted to devote your life to the education and advocacy of racial equity? That's, that's a good, good question. Are there any other white men from Maine in here? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, so my name is Bay Love, just by way of introduction, as, as uh, Jimmy was saying before. Um, it's a really interesting question. It's a question I get all over the country. Oftentimes, people look at me and go, you know, how did you how did you get into this work? It seems so unusual, uh, and it is a little bit unusual. But the the way that I got into it actually, um, it's hard to it's hard to really, as I look back over my life, understand what sort of the turning point was that made me start to look at racism. But what I can sort of think of as, as a couple of the main moments, um, one was when the war on Iraq happened. Y'all remember 9-11? Some people probably remember 9-11. When 9-11 happened when I was a freshman in college, right? And 9-11 happened and then all my professors were walking around campus going, this is gonna change everything. So all, if anyone's flown here, like in an airport, all the airport security that you have to go through and check your bags through radars and all that stuff, we didn't have that before 9-11. All that came after 9-11. I don't know if you remember, you know, terrorism watch, you know, today's a code orange, code red, code yellow. All that stuff came after 9-11. We have, if you've heard of ICE, a lot of the news, immigration and customs enforcement. Before 9-11, that was called immigration and naturalization services. Can you hear the difference? Immigration and naturalization services versus immigration and customs enforcement. So like all of those changes happened from one side of 9-11 to the other. So when 9-11 happened, <clears throat> I was at college and I was sort of trying to figure out what was going on. Everyone was saying this was such a huge deal. And I realized I didn't really understand why it was such a big deal. And you know what all this was really gonna mean for me in my life and for our, for our country. And so then I was sort of watching and listening as things unfolded over the next number of years. And um, it turned out that I was studying abroad in Germany in 2013, so, uh, sorry, 2003. So 9-11 was 2001. I was studying abroad in, in Germany in 2003. The other thing that happened in 2003 is that that's when the United States invaded Baghdad. And I don't know if people have heard of that either. It was, it was called Operation Shock and Awe. And uh, it was publicized. So you could see the bombs actually dropping on Baghdad on the news. And it was publicized in a very sort of deliberate way. That was part of the shock and awe campaign. And I was shocked and I was awed when it happened. And, um, you know, and I'll just speak very sort of openly about it. What I saw happen was after 9-11, there was people that wanted to invade Iraq immediately because the notion was that Al-Qaeda was in Iraq. Well, intelligence came out a few months later that al-Qaeda wasn't actually there, right? Or, you know, may have been some people in Iraq, but that wasn't sort of the base. People didn't think that was sort of a justifiable reason to invade Baghdad. So then we were going to invade, invade Iraq for a different reason. And the, and the reason was that they had weapons of mass destruction, right? And then we found out there was no weapons of mass destruction, right? And if you go Google Colin Powell weapons of mass destruction, you can see the presentation that he made to the American public and to Congress about why there's weapons of mass destruction, but they, that ended up getting debunked. And then you know what happened? We changed the reason for why we were going, and we ended up invading Baghdad anyway. So this whole thing just got my wheels turning. And I know it doesn't sound like it has a lot to do with racism, right? But it really got my wheels turning. It made me realize, you know what? I, A, don't really understand why my country is doing the things that we're doing. And B, I'm not sure I'm getting the full story. Because I felt like I was getting the full story, you know, right after 9-11, then it turned out I wasn't. Then, they, then it was weapons of mass destruction, and it turned out that wasn't true. And then it was actually Saddam Hussein is committing genocide, and then that turned out that wasn't exactly true. So we called it Operation Iraqi Freedom, and in we went, right? And Operation Shock and Awe. So that opened my mind to, wait a second, I gotta make sure I'm getting the full story, and I also wanna understand like, what's happening in my own country because of the impact that our country has, not just in the United States, but across the world. And when I came back and started researching the things that I didn't know about the United States, that's when racism started to come up. Because it was like, I had learned the entire history of the United States, the entire history of the state of Maine, 
and really hadn't learned much about the role of people of color at all, you know, or the role of white people in building a country that really, as I look at the history, was foundationally kind of structured on top of a racial arrangement. And we would sort of mention a little bit racism here and there, civil rights movement here and there, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, maybe Malcolm X a little bit here and there, but never really learned that history in any kind of robust way. And so that really got me curious and thinking, and then I sort of dove headlong into studying racism. The more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know, and the, and the more I kind of wanted to keep going in. So that's a long-winded answer, but hopefully it gives you something to get started with. Yeah, so basically, Nick and his question used the term racial equity, and Nicola, you can speak to this as well. Um, what do you think is like the distinct difference between racial equity versus racial equality? Um, to me, and in the work that I do, we use the term equity, because equality to us is to treat different things the same, right? So you know, that would be like saying, you and I should have exactly the same thing. That, that would be equality. Equity is more about bringing people up to the same level. You know, I forget, I forget who said this, but I, I think it was, might have been Thomas Jefferson, but it says, the most unequal thing is the equal treatment of unequal people. So if people aren't staying at the same, if people aren't starting at the same place, and then we give you know, each group one thing, that might be equality, but it doesn't get us to actual equity because we're not starting from the same place. So that's why we say racial equity and not racial equality. Does that make sense? And I can, I can talk more about it too, but we think that's a, that's a critical distinction. I can tell you what year I graduated. So I graduated in 2000, okay. and I started in sixth grade. Sixth grade, gotcha. So, um, in your uh, span of like six or so years here, um, do you recall race being an issue at all or coming up? I almost don't recall it at all. Um, And that doesn't mean that it wasn't happening here. I think it just means that it, it just wasn't really on my radar. You know, I knew that we had a few students of color at Wayne Fleet, um, but I was more or less not even really attuned or aware of racial dynamics. So kind of going back to like the idea of different terms and stuff. So we hear things like prejudice and bigotry and racism kind of being used interchangeably without really like defining exactly um, what they mean. So what do you think are like the differences in these terms? Between prejudice and bigotry and racism? Yeah. yeah. So I would define it like this. Um, and I think there's a lot, you know, a lot of different sort of organizations have slightly different definitions. But I would say prejudice is just kind of a prejudgment, right? Um, and, and we like to say that prejudice can be for something or against something, right? Like I can walk in a room as a white guy and a lot of people give me kind of a, they make a prejudgment about me that's actually positive. Like, oh, that guy looks trustworthy. Oh, that guy looks, you know, like he has a decent education. That guy looks like he comes from a good family or, or whatever they might prejudge me as. So we would say that's a prejudgment is a preconceived notion of somebody or something without really knowing the facts or the history behind it. Bigotry to us is, is not liking somebody specifically because of part of who they are. So bigot, oh, I don't like you because you're black, I don't like you because you're white, you don't like me because I'm white, you don't like me because I'm white, you know, you don't like me because I'm, you know, male presenting, etc. That would be bigotry. Racism to us is very different because racism, the, the way we sort of describe it at the Racial Equity Institute, is that racism is really about power and about how the, the systems in this country are set up. So we would say that, um, you know, you, you might have some African American people, Latino people, Native American who are bigots, for example, but they can't really be <coughs> racist in the same way that white people can. Because white people, for example, collectively, we, we have power in this country to make everybody else learn our history or history from our perspective, if that makes sense. But Native American people in this state might want all people to learn history from the Native American perspective, but they don't really have the collective power to force everybody to do that. And so that's where racism comes in. Racism is more about collectives of people, their relationship to power, you know, and power just meaning sort of the ability to make things happen, you know, out in the world at different levels. Um, and that's why we would say that's the major difference between racism, bigotry, and prejudice. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit on the, the term that often comes up of like reverse racism and um, sort of 
what would you say to you know, someone who says, well, you know, a person of color can be racist. It's it's like, you know, essentially the same same thing. If you know, you if someone were to say like you're being like critical if you're saying that they can't be, you know, racist. Right, 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 right. <clears throat> well, you know, we would agree that you know people of color really can't be racist in that in that sense. Usually, we think when people say that they're they're confused or not defining racism the same way, right? So we say usually when people say, "Oh, you're being reverse racist," or "People of color can be racist," um, what they mean is people of color can be bigoted. And we would say, "Yeah, people of color can be bigoted against you know white people against other people of color, but they can't be racist in the same way because they don't have the they don't have the leverage or the power to sort of influence policy and institutions." in the favor of people of color. So in, in that sense, we would say, if, if you're using the definition of racism that we use, people of color really can't be racist. And that, you know, some of the data that we looked at in the, in the faculty session really shows that there's not a single institution in this country that serves people of color better than it serves white people. And that's from the, the banking industry to the education system to the you know, child welfare to the criminal justice system to you know, sports and entertainment that all of those systems treat white people better, people of color don't really have significant enough power in any institution to make that institution serve them better collectively. And so that's why I would say people of color may be bigoted or prejudiced, but can't really be racist in that regard because of that collective power. Nicola, do you have anything else you want to add to that? <laughs> no. No, that's good. <laughs> um, I think you talk a lot about how like racism is a system and it's institutionalized and I think that oftentimes a lot of people kind of have a hard time understanding that like racism is more than just you know a personal thing like you saying something racist to somebody so do you want to speak a little bit more about how it is like institutionalized and how it's systemic and yeah yeah sure 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 um. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear how, how you all talk about that, because I, I feel like that's part of the national conversation that's happening right now. Is it institutionalized? What does that look like? What does it mean for it to be institutionalized? But one of the examples that I always think of is just the Constitution of, of the, the United States. Have you all studied the Constitution at, at this point in some regard? Show of hands. It's like most people, right? So let, actually, let's go to the Declaration of Independence, right? Y'all can fin finish this sentence, right? <laughs> Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that are oh and endowed by their creator, right? <coughs> With certain inalienable rights, right? So we all know that. That's the Declaration of Independence, right? <laughs> so as we wrote that and then wrote a constitution in the United States, we were saying we hold these truths to be self-evident and all men are created equal. But what were we doing? We weren't really acting that out. We were saying we hold these truths to be self-evident, but the reality is African-American people were written into the Constitution as three-fifths of a person, right? For the purposes of taxation and representation, right? So the North really wanted, you know, African-American people to not be counted for the purposes of taxation because the South had a lot more African-American people. And if the South counted all the black people, and then got representation in Congress, be, you know, based on that count of people, then the South would have had a lot more representation. Does that make sense? The North, I mean, the South didn't, uh, the South wanted black people to be counted as entire people because then they would have a ton more representation. So three-fifths was actually the compromise to balance power between the North and the South. So it really wasn't about humanizing people of color at all. It was really about balancing that power between the North and the South, right? Native American people, how did they get counted in the Constitution? They didn't get counted, right? So here we have a country that's little, like the legal document that undergirds the entire structure of this country is literally built with race right in the middle of it. And if you think about it, we didn't change the racial parts of the Constitution until the 1860s. Right after the Civil War, some of that gets rewritten, but even after the Civil War, we then go into Jim Crow which is legalized segregation across most of the country. And that goes all the way up until the 1960s or 70s. So you're looking at almost 80% of our collective history 
has legal, you know, racial segregation built into the founding document saying who we are. And every institution in this country, from the education system to the criminal justice system to real estate, how it's bought and sold, who owns it, banks, how they make loans, who doesn't get loans, who gets the loans, all of that was built on that foundation with race built in. So that's what we mean, uh, Tia, when we say institutionalized racism. We mean literally every institution in this country is built with that racial hierarchy built in. And what we did in the 1960s and 70s, we sort of said, okay, you know what? Discrimination is now illegal, right? I mean, that was what the Civil Rights Act and all that was about. I mean, it would be illegal to deny a Tia some rights because she's black and then give me some rights because I'm white. That would be illegal. She could take me to court and, and potentially win. But what we didn't do is we didn't restructure any of the institutions, right? So the institutions are still built and still have the blueprint you know, of institutions that were built during a time of sort of legal racial discrimination. Um, and we think that's a lot of why we see the same racialized outcomes that we, you know, today that we saw even, even 50 years ago. Um, so I think, Jeff, uh, Thank you, Tia. <laughs> um, so I think oftentimes um, white people justify their disengagement um, with issues of race because they feel like they don't experience it. Um, how do you define white people's role in race? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I'll, I'll share what I say around the country as I'm traveling, and now I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it feels like to say it in Maine, but I, I don't know about you all. I, I was brought up as a white person in Maine um, thinking that we didn't really have that much of a race problem here because we didn't have that many people of color here. And I would go to Connecticut or North Carolina and say, boy, you, you all have a lot of racism here, or you know, in the South, you have a lot of racism here. We don't have that much racial tension or racism in Maine because you know, we're just a very white place. So it used to be that I thought we don't have racism because we're mostly white. Now I understand it's the opposite. We're mostly white because we have racism. Does that make sense? And that was a big flip for me. And I'm gonna relate it to your question. So Maine didn't start out white like it is. I mean, you only have to go back 400 years and there was no white people here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we, we got white people through a history of white people come, like coming and moving here. And when white people started moving here, it wasn't like people didn't live here. You look at the names of every river in this state, every county in this state, a lot of roads and highways in this state have names from the Native American people that were living here when white people got here, right? So it was kind of that race, that racial ideology allowed white people to come here, start living here as if we'd always been here, but we haven't always been here, right? And so, so what is what's the role of, of, of uh, you know white people in ending racism? I would say this: one, racism is happening even in all white or majority white spaces. We might not see that it's happening because it's so hidden, but it's happening. Does that make So if I go to a town in Maine, it could be all white people that live in that town, but the town is in Penobscot County. The name Penobscot County comes from the people that were living here before white people founded that town. Right? So the fact that you could have an all-white town in land that used to be Native American land, and nobody in the town even knows that history, that's racism. So I think that was really important for me to realize, wow, even when I'm in spaces that are all white, the people of color coming into, you know, or, or, or being part of our community isn't what made racism start happening there. White people coming to the community is what made racism start happening there. And I had to start to think, oh my goodness, so all these meetings that I'm in when I'm at business school, and it's like all white men and maybe one or two white women around a table and no people of color, racism is happening in that meeting even if there's no people of color around. Does that make sense? And so the role of white people, as I understand it, is part to understand that racism is happening in all those spaces and then start to look and say, how is racism happening here? And how does the fact that I'm in majority white or all white spaces, how is that actually a reflection of how racism is happening and not an indication that racism isn't happening? And, and here's why, you know, why should we care about that? Well, you know, I actually think, and we could talk more about this, but I think that if, we, if white people don't understand how racism is working in our communities and our society, our chances of actually changing or engaging those communities or societies to be better for all of us is very, very slim. Because racism is so core to how our society is set up that if we don't understand that, then what we think is a clear view of our communities and our society really isn't very clear at all. 
And there's a whole bunch of history, in my opinion, that backs that up, which is to say that white people that have engaged in social change efforts over the years, when we haven't had an analysis of racism, we've always had our allegiance with people of color broken up by, by sort of the, the, the forces in the world dividing us based on race. And so in the long run, that hasn't worked out very well for white people. And there's more we can get into there, but I'll let you guys. Yeah, kind of um, going off what you were just saying, I think that oftentimes, sometimes white people will cover up their bias, whether it's implicit or explicit, or their racist tendencies by saying things like, oh, I have black friends, or I voted for Obama, there's no way I can be racist. So I'm wondering, like, what would you say to those people? Okay, so what I would say to them depends on how will I know them? <laughs> what the context is in which we're having the conversation, right? How much time I have, and whether I have my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and I'm kind of serious about those things, right? Because sometimes, uh, if it's already a situation in which the tension is high, uh, you know, I'll kind of assess and be like, you know, like sometimes it doesn't matter what I say to somebody, how smart it is, how kind it is, how sort of humble it is, it's just not going to get through because of the conversation that we're in in the moment that we're in, right? There are other moments, you know, in a moment like this or in a moment like the meeting that we had, you know, uh, with faculty, you know, a while back, it was a space that was literally set up. People came, you know, people were eager to learn, um, you know, I had relationships in the room, you know, I knew where some people were at, so I could say a lot of things, you know, sort of boldly in a way that I might not say in a one-off con. Does that make sense? There are things that I'm even saying today that I wouldn't say if I just met somebody on the street. But you all came here knowing you were going to have a conversation about racism. I know we've got you guys here. We've got Raw. We've got a whole bunch of work happening. So I'm saying some things that are sort of deeper than I might say in a little one-on-one -on -one conversation because I have a sense you know, that there's already some momentum in the conversation happening here. So that would be the first thing I would say is it would depend a lot on the scenario and where I thought people were. But here's, here's what I might answer is I would say, um, to say that you're not racist because you voted for Obama or has black friends or have black friends is to define racism very differently than I define it. Right? So I would say the problem isn't really this Nick, right? Yeah. The problem isn't really that Nick or I am personally racist. The problem is that Nick and I live in a system that gives us advantages just because we're white, whether we like it or not. And here's why that's a problem to me, because people should get you know, uh, advantages, privileges, <coughs> rewards, based on how hard we work, right? If you work really hard, you should get some compensation for it, right? Maybe if you don't work really hard, maybe you should get less compensation. That's not how the United States works right now. The United States works, if, you know, Atiyah and my sister walk into a bank, my sister, who's white, is likely to get a better loan, even if they have the exact same credit score. That's not American values, that's not humanistic values. But the problem is that the system is set up that way. It doesn't matter. My sister might love Atia. Atia might love my sister. The problem isn't whether they like each other or get along. The problem is when they walk into a bank, walk into a hospital, walk into a school system, they get treated differently. And so I think that's where I would focus that conversation is to say, well, you know, I'm glad, you know, uh, for you that you voted for someone that you believed in. That person happened to be black. You know, I'm glad that you have friends across racially. Whether or not we have friends cross-racially really does very little to change the system. And we actually think in some ways, people having those kinds of cross-racial relationships is a barrier to racial progress because of the confusion that comes from people thinking. And we would say white people think this, but, but in our experience, also people of color think that, oh, I've got white friends, or we date cross-racially, or we hang out cross-racially, or we're part of these <coughs> multi-racial groups. We think that because we can get along cross-racially that racism is over or lessening, but we think sometimes it actually makes racism worse because of this. Racism, in our opinion, in, in, in the 21st century, racism requires diversity. In the 1950s, you could have institutions like police departments or governments, right, entirely run by white people, and that was okay. By 1980, what would happen if you had a school system or a criminal justice system run entirely by white people? We think it wouldn't be long before people would be like, well, that's racist to have all white people in charge. And then people would protest and do sit-ins and do it, and they would change it, right? It would be like having all men in charge and no women in charge, 
right? It could be all white men, no white women in charge. You know, people would look at that and go, that's sexist, we gotta change it, right? But all you have to do is take a few women, put them in positions of power, or take a few people of color, put them in positions of power, then when someone comes and says, your institution is racist, the institution goes, we're not racist, we have a black police chief. <laughs> right, or we're not racist, we have a black president. And what happens is, it may be true that we have a black police chief or a black president or a black bank or a black teacher or a, or a Latino teacher or a Latino immigration officer, but the outcomes that the systems creates don't necessarily change at all when we change those positions of leadership. So that would be, I mean, if I had time, Right? How I would engage in that conversation, I would say, I appreciate that, that you have those friends, I appreciate that you voted who you voted for. Let's talk about what we mean by racism, because to me, racism isn't just about getting along or having those relationships. Racism is really about the systems and the institutions, how they're set up, and the outcomes they produce. Could you speak a little bit um, on your journey in terms of, you know, like, Wayne Fleet to college to ending up to where you're sitting now? Sure. Um, what do you want to know about? Um, just yeah, kind of how you how you fell into the, the line of work that you're doing from you know what what like what you were studying in college to moving on to to now being a uh, educator. Yeah, yeah, um, so I graduated from Wayne Fleet, um, and I was accepted early to Wesleyan University, which was amazing. Uh, it was such a privilege to go to a school like Wayne Fleet where I was really being guided to. To college, if that's what I wanted to do, and so I sort of had all that done. I had my SATs done, my essays written, and um, that was so I was really lucky to graduate here with a Wesleyan acceptance already sort of in my lap. And then I took a year off, lived in Spain for a year, um, which was important for me just personally to, to get out of the country and have that study abroad experience and really understand that my perspective as an American, as a, as a, I wasn't really race conscious at that time, so I wasn't really thinking as a white American. I was just thinking as an American. Wow, you know, being American is very different. Spanish, right? So that sort of opened my eyes a little bit. <clears throat> Went to Wesleyan, as I told you about, and when I left Wesleyan, because of all that thinking that I'd been doing, um, I wanted to learn more about racism. And I wanted to learn more about social movements, because I sort of came to believe in college that the, the ways that the United States has really made changes uh, in, in people's access has been through social movements. So like the, the women's movements, like the civil rights movement, like the abolitionist movement, right? <clears throat> um, so I want to learn more about social movements. So I leave Wesleyan and I go to New Orleans, Louisiana. Hurricane Katrina happened when I was a senior, or like right after I graduated. So I leave Wesleyan and I go to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina just to kind of volunteer for a year before I go back to medical school, which was my plan. And, um, and as I was down there, I got so interested in what was happening and, and really started to learn more about racism and how it works on the ground as a system that I, uh, I had been accepted to medical school, but I deferred my admission, deferred my admission, deferred my admission a third time, and then tried to defer my admission for a fourth time. And so I had to make this decision, did I go to medical school or did I not? And by then I had sort of met a lot of doctors, I'd done a lot of sort of soul searching about what that, whether that was what I wanted to do. And I decided actually rather than you know, do clinical medicine day to day, uh, which by the way is what my father did, so I you know, had sort of anchored on that because that was the example that I had. Um, decided that I wanted to do more sort of organizational work and movement building work, and then medicine might have been one way to do that, but probably wasn't the way that I wanted to go. So I ended up staying in New Orleans. I ended up being there for five years. Uh, in that time, learning a lot about racism. I started doing some training on the side. Um, that's like these two-day trainings that Nico and I have been working on bringing to Maine. Um, that was sort of a, a, a foundational training in understanding what racism is as a system and as a structure. Um, and when I went to my first training like that back in 2006, I thought to myself, wow, this explains so much of what I've been trying to understand about racism over, over the years through my own research. And, and uh, because I got so much out of it, I just kept going. So they would keep having these workshops in New Orleans and I would go every time. Every time I would go, I would bring like two or three people with me, friends or people that I worked with or whoever. Um, and then eventually they said, you know what, man, you've been coming to these things so much and you know, you've, you've contributed a little bit more each time. Why don't you actually train to become a trainer with us? Uh, so that's how I became a trainer with the, this group called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. I was working at a nonprofit in New Orleans, but traveling, you know, maybe once a month to different cities across the country doing these undoing racism trainings. And so that's where I got sort of started in that education track. And then I'll give you one more little piece and you guys can ask more questions if you want. After doing that community level work and that training work for about five years, I came to believe that racism really was systemic. And uh, one of my mentors at the time used to say this to us. He would say, a lot of us say racism is systemic, 
but not a lot of us do systemic work. Right? So a lot of us say racism is systemic, but then we do interpersonal or community work and not necessarily systems work. And he's like, since it's systemic, we also have to do systems work. And I was like, well, I don't know how to do that. So how am I gonna learn how to do that? Um, so I ended up deciding to go to grad school for business and public policy to understand how systems work, how policy works, how business and wealth is built. Um, and that's where I went and got those two degrees in North Carolina, Master's in Business, Master's in Public Policy, and left there um, knowing that I wanted to do some sort of systems transformation work that was a combination of my racial equity work and what I had learned in business school and public policy school. So I graduated there in 2013 and I have kind of been building that, um, building that practice since then. Um, thank you. I think that a lot of people um, want to kind of like speak out in the face of injustice and like create change and stuff like that, but I feel like there's people who don't know where to start or what to do, whether it's, you know, the first step is educating themselves or like joining a group or a club or something like that. So what would you recommend that people do in order to like fight the system and really um, do things that are actually Progressive. Yeah, and Nicola may have some, some thoughts about this too, because you know, I know she's been more dialed in with what's happening in Wainfleet, but I, I think, um, I'll tell you, the things that you said are exactly the places that I would go. You know, one is to, to study, like read some things that you have about right? If there's opportunities like there are at Wainfleet, you know, to sign up for an African American history class, sign up for the class. You know, if there's events like this, I think this is mandatory, but if there's optional events and things coming to Canada, campus, you know, sign up for those things and go hear what people are saying. So just educating myself, you know, any kind of way that I could was like one of the major things. And I think the second thing that I would say is the second thing that you said, which is join a group. Like whatever the group is around that's thinking about this stuff and doing this stuff, I would join that group. This is just so much more powerful doing this stuff as collectives and groups than it is kind of doing it individually. So I know there's raw here. Um, I know there's a lot going on in and around Portland. I'm still learning because I just moved back to Portland. But I know there's a surge chapter. I know there's Black Lives Matter work here. I know there's, you know, if that's not your sort of thing and the, and the way that you like to do it, I know there's, uh, you know, things at the main historical society, right? If you're, you know, more into that history and that sort of academic piece, they have some interesting shows coming up. There's a, there's a piece happening at Space Gallery. So just going out, finding out what those different groups are and joining up with those groups are, are, are some of what I would say. The other piece that I would say is that, um, uh, you know, so reading things, learning, joining a group, yeah, finding friends that are also about doing this work as part of the joining the group piece so that you're not doing it alone. And then the last thing I would say is to find mentors who have been doing it a little bit longer than you. Uh, that was so, so helpful for me. So that I wasn't just talking to people that were very new to thinking about racism, but also developed some relationships with people that have been thinking about it for a little while. And that might be professors here, it might be, you know, people that you meet through these other groups, it might be people like Nicole or myself. Um, but having people that were a few years further down the line was always really, really, really helpful. Because this isn't the first time, you know, of course, that racism has been a major topic of tension in the United States. I mean, really, it has been since we became the United States. Um, and so learning from people that have been in that and learning, you know, about that whole process over, over more years has been really, really helpful for me. Hey, go anything specifically on that you want to talk about? I have a sore throat, so I actually need a microphone, although those that are raw know I have a really loud voice. Um, so I loved listening to your conversation. Awesome questions, and you got me thinking. And um, I love the question about, like, what's the role of white people? And as a, I was listening to you, Bay, one of the places I was thinking about where we start <coughs> is feeling. And one of the first things we can do as a radical act is to acknowledge our own feelings about what we see and what's happening to us. So a lot of times we think about racism as, oh, that's that thing those adult people are dealing with, or that's that thing that my brown friend is dealing with, but how do I really feel about it and what makes sense to me? Because if you can't hear your own feelings and your own heart, you can't do anything with the knowledge you get in those great experiences. And talking about feelings can be one of the scariest things we do. To say, you hurt me, or to say, your hurt hurts me, can be one of the scariest things we do. And what does it look like to learn how to do that when you're in high school, instead of when you're 27, like me? 
The other question, I think, to just start is to be really curious about power in all of those experiences that they laid out. You know, we just had this big government shutdown. And I remember being, oh, did I keep this? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I remember, you know, the correlation for me in high school, um, you know, was looking at what was going on in, in, you know, in the late 90s with Bill Clinton and all the international trade agreement. You know, you see all this powerful stuff happening and you think power is something that's happening with those people out there. How are you curious about power in your own life? What is your relationship of power between your friends? What is your relationship with power with the adults in Wayfleet, with your parents? What do you think and know about power? What makes sense to you about power? Not in books, but in your feelings. Because that will help guide you to the place that you need to be taking action and being in relationship to people. So those are the two things I would add in. Feel your feelings and be curious about power because you are a powerful person right now. It doesn't happen when you're 18. It doesn't happen when you're in college. You are a powerful person right now. We're going to have to stop here. I'd like to thank Nico, Bay, Tia, and Nick for this. Story.